Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar from the UK Customs Academy, in which we are going to look at methods of customs valuation, something many UK businesses will be becoming more familiar with in the months to come. My name is William Barnes Graham, and I will be on hand today to facilitate any questions or queries you may have during this webinar. You can use the control panel to the right hand side of your screen to ask questions and send in any comments at any point. We are going to be going through a lot today. It's a packed presentation, so we won't be able to get to everyone's questions, but we'll try, to, try our best to get to the most prevalent ones. And we are also recording today's webinar and sharing a link to the recording after it, so you can download, um, so you can watch the webinar again afterwards, and we can also send you a copy of the slides. Next slide, please. Just to quickly say a little bit about who we are, the UK Customs Academy has been set up by KGH Customs Services and the Institute of Export and International Trade at the request of HMRC to, give, to help pre prepare businesses and individuals for the changes in trade to come and to gain the knowledge and skills to trade successfully. Next slide, please. Now, before we begin today's presentation, we are going to be running a few different polls, starting with this one, one we've been asking regularly during our webinars of late, and it's asking, how prepared do you feel for changes to trade with the EU at the end of the transition period? And while I let, while I let people answer that question, uh, I'd like to introduce today's presenter today, who is Steve Cock from KGH Custom Services, a regular webinar speaker for the Customs Academy. Steve is a true expert in the field with decades of experience working in the industry. Hi, Steve. Hi, Will. Um, thanks very much. Um, decades of experience sounds uh, quite damning in some ways, but uh, yeah, I've been doing customs for about 30 years now. Excellent. Uh, just, uh, sorry about that. Uh... <laughs> put, in, put in years on. I, I don't mean to say it in that way. Um, but um, Steve, while people are answering that question, it's, it's obviously been a big week for the UK. The new border operating model got uh, released by the government on Monday. Do you have any in, initial thoughts about uh, what's, what's been shared so far? Well, I mean, the one thing I would say is it's great that it's finally being delivered to industry. Uh, to a certain extent, um, it will explain clearly what's going to happen on the UK side. The thing that interests me most at the moment is, to a degree, what's going to happen at Calais. Uh, importing and exporting from the UK is going to be relatively clear and, and exporting from the continent as well. But it's more around what's going to happen at Calais to dealing with imports into the continent. From what we understand at the moment, Calais will accept an import into France, but it might require community transit for shipments that leave the UK, say, for Germany. And so that's possibly the biggest unanswered question at the moment. But uh, yeah, it's 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 about time. And I guess it is timely that it's being published, but it is a bit of a read. It's so over 100 pages long. So Yes, yeah, over 200 pages, I think. It's uh, 206. Yeah. And uh we are actually doing another webinar tomorrow uh, with Kevin Shakespeare from the Institute, who's also um, done webinars for the Customs Academy. And that's going to go into more detail about what was revealed in that paper. Um, just to share the results from the first question. So 53% uh, say we are quite prepared uh, for, the, for the changes ahead. 7% very prepared. Uh, approximately around 30% say but not quite prepared or not at all prepared and 10% not yet sure. Um, I'm just going to ask a second question as well. If we can move to the next slide. I'm just going to open this one up now. So this question is actually just reflecting on, on the, what we're just talking about there, which is to ask, were you aware of the new border operating model revealed by government this week? So Steve, it's about... Uh, well over 50% say they are prepared, but quite a few businesses on the line still not prepared. Does that tally with what you've been seeing on the ground so far? I mean, that doesn't surprise at all. Um, there are a lot of companies, big name um, companies that we've worked with, and they've been preparing for years and years. And you could almost argue they're over prepared because they've created things to fit one situation and then almost thrown it away as, as, as matters change. But equally, there are um, many, many companies that have done uh, next to nothing at the moment. And I guess you can understand why that is, because it was always something over the horizon and that horizon was getting further and further away. Well, 
now we know it's here. So I expect that customs in the UK will become massively busy at the beginning of September. People will start putting in the uh, applications they need to do things en masse. And it'll be interesting to see how uh, customs deal with that. My suspicion is that they will authorize people and then play catch up next year. But if you can, if you need something approved, your best bet is to get it in before the end of August, I would suggest. Excellent. And um, yeah, obviously, I don't think many people here will necessarily be able to read all two, 206 pages, but there's a webinar tomorrow, which will tell you what you need to know. And 57% are aware of this already, 43% not. Um, I do recommend some of the guides on the Institute's website, and we'll have some on the Customs Academy site as well shortly. So yeah, plenty to read up on. But for now, I'm going to hand over to you, Steve, for today's presentation. Thanks very much. So um, as Will said, my name's Steve Cock. I'm the Director of Consultancy at KGH Custom Services. Uh, going back a number of years, I used to work for HMRC, uh, and my final job there was to set up valuation training for the staff that visit and inspect, uh, carry out audits at companies. Uh, so uh, ironically, very little has changed since then. Uh, customs valuation is something that is is fairly constant. Um, there are a few tweaks, but anyway, there is a lot to get through. Um, so hopefully, uh, I don't take it too fast. <clears throat> so valuation. This is one of a number of uh, 101 talks that we're planning to give. We gave one previously, which you might like to view, which is available through the Academy website. It's that sort to give a introduction to customs overall, the background uh, position. And in that, we stress three things, that when you're dealing in, in customs, you need to know the value of the goods, the origin of the goods, and the tariff classification of those goods. So this is the first of the three that we're tackling individually. Um, the classification determines the rate of tax. The origin may affect that rate, but valuation is generally what uh, the tax is collected on. Uh, this is a screenshot from one of the academy courses. So if, if this is the type of thing that piques your interest, uh, you can uh, sign up for courses on the academy. And at the moment, uh, you can get a grant to, uh, to do it through the government. So customs valuation. There are six methods of valuation. Uh, they all seek to try and get you to the same point in, in, in regards to the, the value of goods. And there are just a number of ways that you look to do it. You go through them in strict order, apart from four and five can be reversed. Uh, so you go method one, two, three, four and five is up to you. And six, if nothing else can apply, you, you end up there. So going through those in turn. So method one, what is it? That is, the transaction value. If you get an invoice from a customer, that will be the, the value you're going to base your customs declaration around. It's the price that you pay or becomes payable for the goods. And there's a, an important distinction there because it could be at the time you buy goods, you're going to buy them for a hundred pounds. But if you buy enough of them during the year, you may get a discount on that. And that discount may be retroactively uh, applied. So you might end up paying £95 for the goods that you import in that year. If that is the case, you can go back and amend the imports that you've already made and get some duty back. Conversely, it could be that you have uh, additional payments to make and then that can affect the value for duty. So the price paid or payable is a fairly long-winded way of saying it, but what it basically is, it's all payments made by the buyer of the goods to the seller for the goods that are sold to them for export to the European Union. And it could be payments made, uh, it's, it's payments that are made as a condition of sale of those goods. And that could include payments made to a third party. So as an example, you could have somebody who's supplying you with, I don't know, mobile phones. And there are sub assemblies in that mobile phone that the, the manufacturer doesn't want to pay for themselves, that they ask you to pay their supplier. And so that would be a condition of sale of you buying those goods. So that value has to be included in, in the, the value for duty. There are also periodic payments. Um, I've come across situations where the importing company is paying 
the uh, the cost of energy to run a factory. They're paying for the heating, the electricity, and so that kind of uh, element has to be added into the value of goods. Now there are occasions where goods are sold more than one time before they actually end up within the European Union, and if you have a series of sales that lead to the introduction of those goods, you have to go for the one that actually caused the importation of those goods. So a car dealership is a very good example. If you have a, a Japanese car manufacturer that manufactures a whole group of cars and then ships them to the European Union, if they ship them to stock and none of them have been sold within Europe at the time of, of uh, movement, then that's the value for duty. But it could well be that some of those cars have already been sold to car dealerships and maybe some of those dealerships took orders for specific cars to certain specifications and they have been pre-sold to customers. So customs will look to levy duty on the latest sale that they can in that series of transactions. And so if you are involved in that kind of um, structure, it's important to try and distance the later sales from the original supply as much as possible. It's just something to be wary of. Now method one cannot be used if there is a relationship between the buyer and seller and that relationship affects the price. Now ordinarily when you've got intercompany transactions there will be an intercompany transfer pricing agreement and that should take care of that. So it's not something that tends to come up, but it is, again, something to be wary of. If customs ever said to you, uh, you're buying these goods from your supplier, do you get a cheaper price because the intercompany relationship? If you answered yes, then immediately you're disqualifying yourself from using method one. Now, method one cannot be used if the import relates to the movement of stock. So if you have an American company shipping its stock to a warehouse in the UK to fulfill orders, then there is no sale at the time of import. So you cannot base the value of those goods on the selling price because there isn't one. So if you, can, if you do have a transaction price, if there is a invoice that you're going to look to base the value of your goods on, there are a number of things that have to be added and potentially deducted from that value. So the first thing is the value for duty is the delivery cost to the EU border. So we'll come on to that in a bit. Uh, selling commissions also have to be added in. So if you have a Chinese company that is selling a product and it pays an agent to market that product on its behalf to, to improve its sales, then those selling commissions must be added to the price. Buying commissions are different. So if it's the, the buyer who's um, paying those commissions, that, that doesn't apply, but selling commissions do. Royalties and license fees potentially have to be added. We'll come on to that in a sec. Uh, goods and services provided free of charge or at a reduced rate. So I mentioned earlier that you have situations sometimes where the power might be paid for for the factory or that you might get, for instance, coat hangers that are sent out to a factory um, so that clothes can be pre-mounted for import. Things like that, they have to be added into the value for duty. Um, materials, parts, and similar, again, that's coat hangers, so, uh, but uh, swish tags, um, the tags that are sewn into to garments, basically anything, uh, packaging that's provided free of charge. Also, things like tools and manufacturing equipment. It's not uncommon for whole production lines to be set up by the importer of the goods. If you happen to be, let's say, a, a satellite navigation uh, equipment manufacturer, you may set up a third party uh, company to manufacture your product, but you may provide them with the entire manufacturing process to do it. Those costs have to be apportioned and added to the value of goods. Any design work that's undertaken outside the EU, that must be added. Packaging, and as I mentioned before, it's the price paid or payable, so if there's proceeds of resale, then that must be added in. So some specifics then. Uh, the place of introduction. So you're going to have to pay duty on the value of the goods and the cost of freight and insurance to the EU border. In the case of aircraft, it's as they cross that border. So if you're flying from Australia to, to the UK, you're probably crossing the border uh, somewhere 
around Greece or, or Romania, somewhere like that. And so that is your crossing point. And there are tables that tell you how to work this out, the airport of departure and the airport of arrival. Um, in the case of sea, it's when the boat hits the dock or if it's unloading somewhere else within the European Union and then transshipping to the UK, it would have been that port of arrival. At Brexit, I'll obviously have something to say about that. Um, rail, uh, road and inland waterways, it's the point where you get to the first uh, border post. So royalties and license fees, these come up quite a lot and it's probably the hardest area of valuation. They're only payable, the duty is only, only brought to account on them if two conditions are met. And they must relate to the imported goods. The payment is being made in relation to the imported goods and they are paid as a condition of sale of those goods. So when they're sold from outside the community to somebody within the community, if it's a condition of that sale that the royalty has to be paid, then that's dutiable. So a, a good example would be, for instance, a brand of apples. So you may buy a Granny Smith's apple that has uh, a specific type that is marketed under a brand. Um, it could well be that the, the grower in South Africa, every time they ship that apple, is required to pay somebody in, in the UK a license fee for, for the use of that apple brand. That then has to form part of the value of the goods because it applies to the product at the time it's being shipped. So, as I said, it's a difficult area to interpret. Basically, there are two questions to ask. Why is the payment being made? What does the licence payer get out of it? And at whose behest is the payment made? So, is it made as a condition of the sale? But if, if you get involved in royalties and licence fees, it, it is quite a complex area and there are examples that you can refer to. We'll come on to that. So deductions, as I said, there are additions and there are deductions. So delivery costs within the EU. So as soon as you hit the EU border, if the, the, the value that you're buying the goods on is delivered to your premises, then if you can separate out the delivery costs in the EU, then you can deduct that. Uh, buying commissions, so if you instruct a agent for you in the Far East to source goods for you, the buying commission that you pay them, that doesn't have to be included in the value for duty. Duties that occur uh, within the European Union. So when you import goods, if you're importing them on duty paid uh, terms, deliver duty paid, then you can work backwards. You can de deduct the amount of duty that is being paid under those terms and then reassess the value for duty. You can also deduct things like early settlement discounts and quality and quantity discounts. So if, uh, it, if, you're, if you pay within 30 days and you get a 2% deduction, then you can amend the entry probably after the fact because you will have paid on the, the full value. But if you can demonstrate that you are making early settlement payments, you can reduce the amount of duty that you've paid. And as I've previously mentioned, if you buy enough of a particular type of product in a year, you may get a, a quantity discount. Um, you may get a discount because the, the product that you bought, say it was fruit, it's found on inspection not to be of sufficiently high standard uh, and instead of going to a supermarket it goes to market uh, and therefore your supplier gives you a discount uh, that can be deducted from the value for duty. Uh, there are some other things I'll come on to in a sec, dividends, management charges, uh, uh, marketing um, and a number of other things so we'll come on to those. So there is always an offset between the payment of corporate tax and the, the payment of, of customs duty. There's a pecking order effectively in that. Corporate tax tends to impact companies far more than customs duty. Uh, corporate taxes tend to be in the 20% the range and unless you're talking about foodstuffs, customs duty is much lower. And so when companies set up their intercompany uh, transfer pricing structures, they do so in terms of determining whether where they're going to make their profit. And so um, profit will be repatriated uh, to uh, the parent company, potentially in the form of dividends or management fees. Those are not dutiable amounts. But within that, you will have a corporate tax structure where the, the two states involved will be policing to make sure that there is a good intercompany transfer pricing structure, that profit is made uh, and taxed 
appropriately. So customs duty tends to follow that. It should always be the case, as I mentioned earlier, that the intercompany transfer pricing does not affect the price. Um, but anyway, um, it, it, the corporate tax position always tends to be dominant. Uh, marketing activities, obviously goods that are going to be sold will tend to be marketed. Um, and if those costs are borne by the importer, then they're not dutiable. But if the seller um, incurs those costs within the European Union, then they are dutiable. And that's the case even if the buyer arranges for them to happen and that they invoice the seller uh, for those costs. So it's important if you're undertaking marketing that the buyer should always be the one who does it to their own account. <clears throat> Charges for interest under a financing agreement, though these can be deducted, uh, but they must be separately distinguished. So if you pay £100 for a product and you get given 90 days to pay for it and you're allowed a 2% uh, of the transfer price is the cost of you arranging the financing, then that's fine. That's not dutiable, but it must be uh, separately distinguished. And if you're challenged by it, by the authorities, you would have to be able to demonstrate that a, a prompt payment means that that, uh, that element of the price is discounted. Now, at the moment where interest rates are low, this isn't a big deal, but if you go back a number of years, or if you're dealing with a country where interest rates are rife, um, particularly South Africa, this happened a lot with uh, about 20, 30 years ago, people will be given a year to pay for goods. And given that the interest rate was over 100% at times, you could almost wipe out the value of goods um, under this arrangement. There's also the fact that if you're if the contract that you're dealing with allows for work before the goods arrive or after the goods have arrived, you don't have to include that into the value for duty. So very commonly things like power generation. If you've got a wind turbine going up, it's probable that the company that are installing it have done a survey to find out what uh, where the best place to plant that turbine is. And also they will erect it or test it or do something. All of those costs could be deducted from the value for duty. So that's the transaction price based on the invoice value. There are five others, and I'm going to rattle through these quite quickly. The first is identical goods. So at the time of the sale, you also get a stock transfer, for instance. And so you know that the products are identical. It's just that one's associated with the sale, the other not. So what makes a good identical? Well, it must be from the same country of supply. In the case of jeans, which is a good example, it would have to be the same brand of jean, the same material that was used in manufacture, the same style, the same size, the same color. Everything would have to be the same. Basically, the question to ask is, would a customer accept that if you interchanged it? And if the answer to that is yes, then potentially you could go for an identical value. But to be able to use method two, there must be a method one transaction that you apply it to. And if customs want to see that method one transaction, you must be in a position to supply it. So in general, method two is only open to those who are basing it on their own goods. So then there's method, method three, which is similar goods. Um, and a good example here might be, you've got a trawler landing a catch of prawns and half the prawns are sold to a supermarket at a set price and the other half are sent to market and there is no price at the time of import. And so you could use the, the invoice to the supermarket to declare similar goods. Uh, similar things apply. The goods uh, can only differ, differ in certain respects. They must be produced in the same country. Again, they must be commercially interchangeable, um, So, but not to the same level. So you could have it that um, you have genes, uh, like women's genes of a certain style, but maybe the sizes aren't exactly the same or that the colors aren't exactly the same. They're similar, but not identical. And importantly, the goods can be made by a different manufacturer, but again, you have to be able to get hold of a, a method one transaction to base this on. And so again, it's quite hard to use because unless you can get that evidence, you're not going to be able to use somebody else's import. It must be your own. Uh, method four is a deductive method. So this is based on the sale price of the goods and you work backwards. So the sale price within the EU and 
So one, two or three must be used in order, four and five can be interchanged. So you can make a number of deductions, either the commission usually paid or agreed to be paid uh, on, on the goods or the general profit that would have been made for sales of those kinds of goods within the community. You can also take off the usual costs of transport and insurance within the UK and the EU and you could take off the costs of customs duties and other taxes. So again, it's mirroring the type of thing that you can deduct under method one. So you can use this for processing as well. So if goods are imported and processed, if you can separate the processing charges, uh, you, can, uh, you can deduct that. So goods might come in, for a certain amount of processing before sold on. Uh, if they weren't sold, if they were sent to somebody for manufacture, say a parent company in Japan sent it to a subsidiary for further work, you can then uh, work backwards and take off the cost of processing. There are some very specific rules for fresh fruit and vegetables. I'm only going to say that you should be aware of this if you're in this, this market, uh, but it's basically the EU publishes set values for goods. They're called simplified procedure values, so you can rely on those. A lot of fruit is sent on consignment. There is no sale. And so the EU monitors the markets to see what goods are sold at and then, and then publishes that data. So method five, that's the opposite of method for it's a computed method and so basically you have to have access to the information provided by the supplier of the goods you have to have the costs of manufacture cost of packaging you also have to allow an element of profit and general expenses for the supplier and then again you've got to add back in the cost of transport insurance and delivering the goods to the eu border so in terms of evidence, this is very difficult to use if you don't have the assistance of the supplier of the goods. Um, so on demand, you have to be able to show to customs uh, what the cost of the raw materials were, anything that they effectively want to see. And if you can't provide that, then they can uh, prevent you from using method four, sorry, five, which then points you back to using method four in its place, because you, of course, would be able to work backwards. So finally, method six, which is the fallback method, this basically relies on any reasonable accounting method. It's normally, it's, it's very rarely seen, but it's normally a flexible use of one of the other methods. So it's allowing a degree of leeway in terms of, um, for instance, under method four, uh, you should base it on sales that occur 90 days after the goods are being imported. It could be under method six that that is extended and you, you look at sales after 120 days. So I've given you a quick overview of, of the six methods. There's quite a lot more if you were to go into it in, in, in depth, um, but that's a good starting point. So I'm gonna hand you back now to Will and he will ask another poll question. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Steve. So next poll question we're going to ask is how will you be uh, completing customs declarations and uh, the, the options are i am already able to complete them i plan to learn how to complete them i will hire a customs intermediary to complete them i'm not yet sure or i will not need to and just while people are answering that question we actually had uh, someone ask a, a question related to this so ian has asked um who is responsible for the customs valuation calculation? It would be good to know where an intermediary is making the declaration. Um, so is it something that an intermediary would do on behalf of the company or is it done by the company themselves? Well, it, it really ought to be done by the company themselves. So intermediaries, they can either act on a direct basis or an indirect basis. If they're acting on a direct basis, it's purely at your behest. If it's indirect, then they're starting to take liability uh, equally with you for the taxes that are being paid. So if you went out of business, for instance, um, they would be left carrying the, the debt that you had left behind. And so for an intermediary, it's important to be seen as being a direct representative only. So it could be that they point out how to value your goods and that the rules that you should follow. But at the end of the day, the importer should be the one that's saying to the intermediary, this is the invoice price. These are the other things that you should take into account. The intermediary could work with you to make sure it's right, but they shouldn't be determining it for you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I'm just going to show the results of that poll. 
So 26% are already able to complete them. I imagine a few of our students might be among those, um, but then we've got 19% planning to learn and 40% will hire a customer's intermediary. So um, that's, that's a very interesting part there. Um, but back to you, Steve. Thank you. So moving on, there are a few more considerations. Um, the first is import VAT. Uh, I mean, one of the, the good spin-offs from Brexit is import VAT to a certain extent will be a thing of the past because rather than actually come up with the money and pay it at import, it's going to become a accounting mechanism within the, the, the VAT declaration. But nevertheless, there is a requirement to get it right. And if, if, if you get it wrong, um, then on the VAT side, the visiting officers are far more likely to uh, call for tax and also to uh, levy a penalty up to 100% of the tax that hasn't been collected. So even though the money isn't going to be paid, it's going to be very, very important to make sure you get it right. So on top of the value for duty, that's your starting point, you're going to have to um, add in some additional items. Now, normally on the customs declaration itself, at the moment, as an import is made, the value for VAT is also built up. But like I say, in the future, there won't be a VAT payment at import. And so you must get that value properly accounted for in your VAT return. And so basically anything else to do with the supply of those goods should be included. So all incidental expenses such as commissions. So if you're paying a buying commission, it might not be subject to import duty, but it is subject to import VAT. And of course, that can be pretty high. That can be 10 to 15 percent of the value of the goods that you're importing if you are paying a commission. There are also things like packaging, transport and insurance cost. Once you've once you've crossed the the what will then be the UK border. And there's also basically all sorts of other incidentals. So it might be that the goods are temporarily stored before they're delivered to your premises. Uh, you have to include customs duty in that calculation. So if you have. Uh, it, it, if there is no free trade agreement with the European Union, or if there is one and it hasn't been solidified in terms of your particular product line, if you're in the agricultural sector, you might be paying 20, 30, or even more percent duty on the goods that you import. It would be a sting in the tail if you then don't properly account for the VAT on, on that duty if it applies, because as I say, then the visiting officer may audit you for that and hit you with a penalty of 100% of it. You also have to uh, account for any other duties that might be chargeable, such as excise duty. So one of the hidden dangers of, of Brexit, or perhaps the, the biggest hidden danger, is the import of that one. So I would strongly suggest that you work on that. OK, so that's basically the, the rundown of valuation on a, on a common basis. That's the type of thing that you might expect to find. There are uncommon things like the supply of samples or the uh, supply of free of charge goods, things like that. Now, in those circumstances, they can be quite tough to, to pick out what's right and what's wrong. But rather usefully, the World Customs Organization and the European Commission have provided a series of commentaries, um, their official guidance, effectively, into how to deal with uh, import valuation. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, the publication by the World Customs Organization comes in at 140 euros. It's a, it's a more com comprehensive document, but the EU one is free to download. Uh, I have to say that it has got a lot of blanks in it now. If you look up, it'll have commentary one, two, three, and they'll all be deleted. But there are a number of useful ones in there, and it's a PDF, so you can do a useful word search on it. Uh, but if you are dealing with free of charge spies, royalties, that kind of thing, it, it can be a help. So I've I've come up with a few to to run through. Um, so it, in addition to the the fact that it's got commentaries, as an example, the uh, the European Union one has uh, references to the European Union court cases uh, that um, have set legal precedent in the area as well, uh, and that is very helpful. It's a bit of a read, but it is helpful. So um, running through a few things then. So starting with defective goods. Um, so if goods arrive and they've been damaged in transit, uh, so they should have been damaged uh, prior to the time of import, uh, then you, you don't have to pay the full 
uh, amount of duty on it, or if you've already paid the full amount of duty on it, uh, you should be able to make a recovery. Um, it's important to say that those damaged goods, they might not be immediately apparent that they were damaged at the time of import. So if goods are covered by a warranty, for instance, uh, you can go back in time and recover duty. And it, over time, I've done some pretty big uh, warranty claims for companies. So if you are going to demonstrate to customs that the damage has uh, has happened, you'll have to provide evidence to them. Uh, so generally, the best thing is a credit note from the, su the, the supplier of the goods. If they've accepted liability for the problem with the goods, that will gen generally get you a duty refund. Um, it's just possible that a customs officer would have examined the goods. It's very unlikely, but it is just possible if they did a statement from them. But if the goods have, have, uh, have come in, uh, it could be that your supplier has said to you, well, I want to have a certificate from somebody who's independent to say that they're not good enough, particularly in the food sector. Um, but a port health uh, official may have inspected the goods, again, a report from them. Um, but uh, um, a statement from an independent expert, um, a surveyor of that particular type of product, that would certainly do as well. So warranty adjustments. Um, so if a, a manufacturer in a third country, for instance, send, sells a motor vehicle to an EU importer, uh, if the agreement, which it no doubt does, says that if there are defects uh, arising from the manufacturer or the design of the goods, that the manufacturer will compensate the importer, then obviously that importer may at some point in the future make a, a warranty claim. Now, if the, if the agreement states that that is the case, then the importer can go back to customs and can apportion over the, the, the suppliers of, of that particular vehicle or product that were made and recover the duty as a proportion, whatever the proportion of the, the value being refunded, they can recover that proportion of duty. And so I don't know quite how Whirlpool, for instance, managed their affairs in terms of the goods that they were importing, but there's obviously been a lot of problem with tumble dryer files. And so if the, the supplier was accepting the liability for that in that case, there would be a lot of duty potentially to recover. Um, there are instances where a warranty adjustment wouldn't be um, uh, liable to a refund. So in the same circumstances, it may be that the, um, the manufacturer of the vehicle says, well, we're finding that one in a hundred are going wrong and that we need them all to be checked to make sure which one in a hundred it is. And so in those circumstances, there would be a, uh, a refund to do the recall process, but there would also be a refund, no doubt, to do the actual repair work on the one in 100. It would only be the repair work that was entitled to the refund, not the actual recall, because you're not actually uh, repairing defective goods. Um, replacement goods in a subsequent shipment. So it could well be that uh, you have a, a shipment arrive 100 items and 10 of them are found to have been smashed in transit. Uh, rather than give a credit because the additional 10 are needed, it could be that the supplier says, well, on the next ship, there will be another 10 coming your way. In those circumstances, when you import the goods, you're going to have to pay duty on the 10 that are coming in because they are um, goods that can be valued, not under method one, but under identical goods, because you've already had 10 probably within the last 90 days. So you would pay duty on, on those 10 that were coming in. Having said that, you could go back to the original declaration and recover the duty on the 10 that were found to be defective at the time of import. So you also get free of charge goods supplied with invoiced goods, quite commonly samples. So they can be at times free um, from paying duty and sometimes they might be dutiable. So in this example, we have a company that is supplying 5,000 perfume bottles, 4,000 are for sale and 1,000 identical bottles are delivered free of charge. They're marked with tester not to be resold. So in this circumstance, if the contractual arrangement allowed for the supply of the free samples, so you knew you were going to get 5,000, and you were paying for 5,000, even though effectively you were only paying for 4,000, then you only base the value for duty on the 4,000. If it happened to be the case that the contract was only for 4,000 and sort of out of the goodness of their hearts, the supplier added in another 1,000 goods, 
then you're going to have to pay duty on those. So again, it would be identical goods and you would pay duty at, at, at the invoice price for the 4,000. Uh, slightly different scenario, you get free of charge um, samples. Uh, in, in this case, these are giveaways, so not to be uh, used by somebody in a shop as a testing, but to be given away uh, to tempt people to, uh, to buy the product. And pretty much the same follows. So if you have, an, if, if you have the case that uh, it was included in the contract, you're not going to have to pay duty. However, again, if they were supplied free, you are going to have to value them. And this would get difficult because it could well be that the value isn't the same as proportionally the same as the product that you've bought. Because it could be argued that the sample bottle, maybe it has a higher value than the actual product itself on the resale market. It may well be that a small bottle of perfume um, retails for less than half the price sorry, for more than half the price of a bottle twice its size in, in the open market. And so it may well be that getting a free of charge supply, you're actually having to pay more duty per volume for the free of charge part. So in both of those scenarios, the answer is make sure that the contract of sale covers the free of charge supply. Uh, finally, um, testing. There's a useful commentary on, on testing. Um, to do with testing fees. So there are two ways that that might be undertaken. It could be that the, uh, the manufacturer pays a third party to test goods before they're dispatched, uh, and that could be included in the contract of sale. Or it could well be that the buyer themselves decides that they're going to have somebody overlook the goods before they're uh, delivered dockside for them to take away. Now, in either circumstance, that test fee is dutiable. And it's considered dutiable because you're buying goods of a certain quality. And at the time of import, they're known to be of that certain quality. Therefore, they have been tested to make sure that they are of that quality. Hence, the test fee either way is dutiable. The, it would mean that the goods had to be transported to the EU first. But to save on that, the better scenario would be that you arrange the testing to take place in the UK upon delivery. But of course, commercially, that might not be acceptable. So those are just a few of the examples that are contained within um, the, the compendium. If you have something that's slightly different, you might find um, that it's worthwhile checking in one of those. So to, to bring my presentation to an end, so some considerations for Brexit. Um, the main problem is going to be for companies that are multinational, that have supply chains built up um, through a number of countries, a number of legal entities, because investments will take place within those companies within the supply chain. It could be that somebody has developed a product overseas in France and all of the design work was done in France. Well, at the moment, that wouldn't be a dutiable consideration. If the goods are then manufactured in, in China and imported, well, the design work was done in France, not a problem. But if that design work is in France and now you're importing to the UK and we've left the EU, then it becomes a consideration. Also, consider the terms of trade. I've tried to stress how important it is for the VAT implications. Import VAT is going to be a big fallout of, of Brexit. Whoever is the owner of the goods at the time of import must be the person that declares them. Because if you're not the owner, you're not legally entitled to recover import VAT. So if somebody is delivering duty paid to you, and you decide that to make things easier, you'll become the declarant of those goods, uh, even though they, they're going to cover the duty, bit, the, the duty bill. If you declare those goods on their behalf, you didn't own them at the time of import, you account for the VAT through your VAT return. When you're visited by a customs officer, they will demand all the VAT that you have, um, you have failed to pay, that you notionally have paid and then recovered, and they will hit you with a penalty on top of that. So if you're not the owner of the, the goods after Brexit, whatever you do, do not declare them. Um, where goods are delivered duty paid uh, by an EU supplier, method one can be used if the goods are pre-sold. So under this scenario where it's delivered duty paid, even though the, the sale is taking place once the goods have cleared customs, you can still use method one for that. So if any, if any of your suppliers says, well, 
I have no value to base the, the declaration on, they do, and they can work backwards and take out elements like transport to your premises from the point of entry to the UK. The final point I would say is HMRC have been um, largely underfunded in terms of customs work for a good number of years. Because they've been an agency of the, the European Union, customs duty has not been their tax. It's going to become their tax again. And they are being asked to uh, go back out there and start auditing, auditing companies. The Treasury are very interested once more because it's their tax. And so they're getting additional funding for audit. They're going to get a lot more officers and particularly after the implementation period uh, after um, June next year ends, those auditing officers are going to be coming out there to make sure that people have declared the goods that they've imported when declarations didn't necessarily need to be made. And they're also going to start cracking down on um, correct valuation, classification and origin of goods. So it's just something to, to, to bear in mind. Um, that's, that's the end of the presentation. I would say to you that there is a great deal more to be found on, on classification, valuation and origin in the courses provided by the Academy. I'm now going to hand you back to Will. I think he probably has a, a final poll. Yes, I do. So I'm just going to ask this final poll quickly. Just are you aware of the government grant funding for uh, customs training? The options there are yes, and I've accessed it. Yes, I've tried to apply, but not been able to access it. Yes, I have, but I've not yet tried to access it. No, but I'm interested. And no, and I'm not interested, essentially. Um, and just while I let people answer that question, uh, Steve, you've had a few people ask again about intermediaries. Um, so I'll do one from Nicola who's asked, what do we do if our intermediary makes an error? For example, charges us VAT when the item should have been imported as exempt from VAT and duty. Do we still have to pay them back um, and then claim back when we submit our VAT return or should they claim it back themselves? Okay, so the VAT would have been incurred in the course of your business. Um, because you were the importer of records. So the agents got it wrong. I would assume that if you weren't able to recover it, um, you could um, pursue the agent for having done it incorrectly on your behalf. Equally, it may be that you're out of pocket and, I don't know, you get additional bank charges or, or some knock-on effect. And it could be that you said to the intermediary, well, you need to make good on that. But the intermediary will not be able to recover it themselves from the authorities. Great, thanks Steve. And just to quickly show people the answers to that poll. Um, and yes, it's 36% have been able to do it. 34% uh, are interested but not yet tried. 7% uh, still trying. Um, and obviously there's always help on hand for those people. Um, and then about 24% no, but many of them are still interested. I would just add one one comment on the grant scheme. So the government put in a lot of money uh, at the outset when they asked us with the Institute of Export to set up the, the Customs Academy. Uh, there was a, a large grant available for people to undertake training. Eventually that money ran out and for a period, um, PwC who administer the grant system were taking um, applications onto to their books, but they weren't processing them. And a, a new grant has been added, 50 million pounds, which has meant that all of those in the pipeline are now being cleared through. And I think they have been cleared through. So if you have one pending and you haven't heard, it would definitely be the time to chase up uh, PwC about that. Uh, but the other thing to say is you may have heard that some grant applications were taking two, two plus months to get through the system. And that was sadly the case, but that's because the grant had run out. Now that it's back open again, you should find it's a lot quicker. And I would hope within a week or two that you would you would get it processed. Back to you, Will. Thanks, Steve. And we just had someone ask um, if individuals are able to apply. My understanding is that it's companies have to apply, but I know the Institute, um, and I'm sure on part of the Customs Academy as well, are looking to push for government to make it available for individuals. But um, my understanding at the moment is that it's only available for companies. Okay, so um, this, this this did come up at a um, 
uh, a session in Parliament um, uh, a week or so ago at one of the committees, and they were discussing exactly that problem, the fact that individuals uh, aren't able to gain access. So certain individuals can. So for instance, if you live in Wales, um, the, the, the government there have a grant system, not specifically for customs intermediaries, but a wider one, and people can access that. People who are leaving the military, there is a grant system, I understand, there as well for, for people to access, and, and that would uh, be something that you could call on. We, Will's right, we are asking time and again uh, government to open it to individuals. That decision hasn't finally been made, but we're very hopeful that it will in the next month or so. Great, thank you. Thank you, Steve. And if we can move to the next slide. Um, we're getting lots of questions but if you do have any questions you want to ask us um please do do so using the directions there um but uh, as mentioned lo lots to get through so the first question i'm going to ask is from k who asks what if you are importing an item uh, you know is defective back to the uk for repair how could the value be calculated in that scenario yeah, that's quite a, uh, a a difficult one. Um, that would have to realistically be under method six because uh, unless there was a sale at the time that the goods were transferred, you're not going to be able to go for similar or identical goods because unless something's broken in the same way, uh, that wouldn't apply. Um, the cost plus method, that doesn't apply or the resale minus, you're not selling it. So you end up in method six. And, and the best thing I can say for you there is, how old is the product? And under normal accounting principles, what would the value be uh, for its age? So if it's something that's 20 years old and it's pretty much scrap value unless it's repaired, then that's what you would go for. But if it's only a year or so old, just out of warranty, and you'd normally write it off over the course of say four years, then maybe that's its value. Maybe it's three quarters the price of the original. Uh, to a certain extent, it's going to have to be just being sensible about it. But that, that's the way I would always go for that on that. Thanks, Steve. And a couple of questions we've had in on uh, implications of different INCO terms. So Davis asks, under DAP, where the importer enters the goods but does not own them, how does that work for VAT? And Ian, another Ian, has asked, uh, should we be providing clearance instructions for shipments that are sent to us under DDP? whether the export is from EU or third countries, and that's EU post-Brexit. Okay, so again, I just can't stress it strongly enough. If you had an audit um, two, three years after uh, Brexit has properly happened, and the auditing officer said you have incorrectly recovered VAT on all of your imports for the last three years, so we want 20% of that, and by the way, I'm going to hit you with a 100% penalty. You're effectively getting 40% of the value of all goods as a, as a VAT bill. I'm not saying that that's definitely going to happen, but that is the kind of dangerous scenario that companies face. And so you need, if, if that's the, the way that you're heading, you must, I would argue, change your uh, delivery terms. Within the European Union, that we've lived on largely X works and delivered duty paid because they made sense, because you're either having to pick up goods yourself from a factory in Spain and arrange all the transport yourself, because why wouldn't you? That's a sensible thing. Or you're getting the Spanish company to drop it at your door. We're now entering a world where the normal rules of international trade apply. So typically, if you were buying from Brazil, you would buy uh, FOB delivered to the dockside or CIF delivered to the UK dockside, because that's what makes sense. One of you does the export, one of you does the import. And so realistically, look at your terms of trade and, um, and, and, and bring them, well, make them compliant is what I would say. For the, for the delivered uh, uh, duty paid, if the supplier is, is delivering them, then they must be responsible for arranging everything to do with the UK import. And that may be a problem for them because if they have no UK, prem uh, no UK um, uh, legal entity, then, uh, they're going to potentially struggle to get a declarant to work on their behalf. Uh, they will have to be VAT registered and that, that's easy enough. But if they want to do a standard import and export, then somebody will have to represent them on an indirect basis, take on uh, liability for those goods. The one saving grace is that Customs Freight Simplified Procedures, CFSP, the terms for that 
customs are going to allow brokers to operate that for third country importers on a direct basis. Now, how long that lasts, I don't know, but that would be uh, that would be their saviour. So, if you've got people exporting or uh, third country now exporting to the UK from France, wherever they need to find a broker that's CFSP approved. Thank you, Steve. Uh, a question in from Elvis, who's asked, what would be the method for intercompany sales, e.g. a US company selling to its UK limited company? Well, if there's an invoice price, it must be method one, unless the intercompany relationship affects the price. Um, now, with the best will in the world, um, there must be some uh, relationship influence on the transaction. But if 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 you acknowledge that there is, and if there truly is one, uh, then you'll be kicked off method one. But then that doesn't necessarily just limit itself to problems in the customs world. Then you've got problems in the corporate tax world because you're basically acknowledging that your intercompany transfer pricing for corporate tax purposes is at issue as well. So it's a very um, dangerous uh, territory to get into. Uh, all I would say is if there's a invoice, you would generally base it on that. If it's a movement of stock, as I said earlier, if it's just transferring stock for then sale out of the UK, then you have to go for an alternative means and you just go through them, two, three, four and five interchangeable, six is your fallback. Thanks, Steve. Uh, a few quick questions to finish off. Uh, firstly, one, which is, will a recording be made available or handouts of the slides? Yes, it will be sent to all the registrants to this webinar. And if you don't, for whatever reason, get it, please email us at info at ukcustomsacademy.co.uk. Uh, a question from Richard is, how should the cost of tools and machinery be uh, provided to a manufacturer be apportioned to goods imported, for example, over the five-year life of the equipment? Uh, unfortunately, it's exactly that. So if you think you're going to produce a million mobile phones a year for five years, uh, that's your calculation. You divide the cost of the tooling by five million and you add that small amount onto every product that you import. Um, and theoretically, if it was a 10 year tooling life, again, the same applies. Uh, I guess to a certain extent, common sense would take over uh, and customs wouldn't object if you got it out of the way a bit quicker than that. But no, it's basically the life of the tool. Thank you, Steve. And one last question from Gary. He's asked, if I give a router for free on condition they sign up to get internet from me at a variable cost, what value should I use? Okay, so the money that you're getting back is obviously to do with the, the service you've provided rather than the goods. But that doesn't mean to say that you haven't got a value that you can go back to. So for instance, you will have bought that server potentially in the UK uh, to onward supply to whoever it is that's going to use it. Uh, at the time you acquired it, you might have acquired it for stock, but I would think you probably acquired it to ship out to your customer. And so therefore you've got a transaction that is leading to the export of those goods. Um, you may well have to increase it to take account of uh, your profitability. So it might not be that you're um, going for a straight method one, um, but potentially method one might be open to you. Otherwise a computed value um, based on your additional costs to get the goods to your customer. Great, thank you. Well, um, we're running out of time. As we said at the top of the webinar, uh, we weren't gonna, going to be able to get through all the questions today, but hopefully we've answered some of them either through the presentation or in the Q&A just then. So yeah, thank you once again to Steve for the presentation there. Um, on this final slide, you will see uh, some contact information for how you can get in touch with us. Um, please do, as you leave the webinar, let us know any further suggestions for future topics. Um, and we'll leave the slide open for a few minutes um, just while we exit the call. So um, yeah, thank you again for listening in and we hope you found that useful. Thank you. Thanks, goodbye.